The time has finally come to talk about legal paternal surrender, as I've been saying for at least a month now. My excuses are thus. This is a lot of material to cover, it's all written down, but it's a lot to go through, and in the meantime, as I've been trying to film this, I've had to get a haircut, among other things, and that wouldn't have made much sense to just jump in after having that done. And my neighbor's pipes kept interrupting pretty much every other take, but they've been very quiet today, so here's hoping that works out. Now, uh, I do have a lot written here, so I will be looking down below the camera a lot. I realize that that's not very engaging, so I will try to paraphrase a few, few paragraphs, but generally speaking, with such a touchy subject, it's very important to have some literary nuance, which is why I've bothered to write all this down. So forgive me on that front, here's the video. Legal paternal surrender, LPS, is the idea that men who unintentionally become fathers should be allowed to walk away from their parental duties to their child, in the form of child support, for example. This would mirror women's right to walk away from their parental duties via abortions. In our current system of laws, consent to sex is not consent to parenthood, but only for women. Legal paternal surrender would extend this right to men as well. In effect, it would provide men with the legal equivalent to an abortion, which would give them the same sovereignty over their futures as parents, or as non-parents, that women have. This, I believe, would be more equal than our current system. Now, because this topic is very touchy and very easily misunderstood, I would like to briefly clarify what LPS is not. LPS is not spousal consent, where the mother can only abort if the father approves. Nor is it forced abortion, where the mother is required to abort if the father demands it. Legal paternal surrender would have no effect on the mother's power to choose or refuse an abortion for herself. It would simply give the father the same right to refuse parenthood and walk away that the mother already has. This would mean no child support, no duties whatsoever. To reiterate, I am not saying that the father should have the power to force a woman to abort her fetus, nor to force her to keep it. I am arguing that the father should have the legally protected right to completely sever ties to his future children, just as women can sever ties to their future children via abortion and their born children via safe havens. It is still her body and it is still her choice, but it's also his future, and I think he should have that choice, not her. Now, before I get into the meat of this video, I would first like to extend a kind of philosophical olive branch to those who would disagree with me. I would like to bring up a very specific set of cases where I hope we can all agree that some form of legal paternal surrender should be allowed. Specifically, I'm talking about cases of female rapists raping men, where the female rapists get pregnant, give birth, and then, in pretty much every case I've been able to find, if not just every case, uh, they have been able to turn around, sue their male victim for child support, you know, for the child that they got through rape, and win. I have not yet found a case where a female rapist who has kept the child has sued for child support and lost. And I'm going to go through a few cases where this has happened. There was SF v. Alabama, where a woman had sex with an unconscious man, you know, she raped him, got pregnant, and won child support when she sued him. And, on top of that, she had the audacity to go on saying that it saved her a trip to the sperm bank. And, of course, now she's getting free money. Then there was State of Louisiana v. Frissard, names are weird, where a man received a blowjob through a condom, the woman kept the condom, inseminated herself with it, had a child, sued him for child support, and won. Isn't that kind of ridiculous? Uh, there was a 1996 case of an underage boy who was raped. He was 15 years old, and he was required to pay child support for the resulting child, or his family, until he was 18. I don't know how that works. Uh, similar, there was a case of Hermesman versus Sayer. Names are weird. Uh, where a 13-year-old boy was raped by his 17-year-old female babysitter and forced to pay child support. Like I said, I hope we can all agree that in these specific cases, legal paternal surrender should be allowed in some form. As it turns out, in these court cases, the judges have ruled that the financial welfare of the child takes precedent over the rights of the male rape victim. But I say, if the mother can't afford it, give her some welfare, just like anyone else. 
or just take away her rape child, but don't force her rape victim to help support a child that he had no say in creating. I'll talk more about the financial stuff in a minute, but as I originally said, I hope we can all agree that in cases like these, the father should be allowed to sever ties with the child. Now let's move on to the broader argument. As I stated before, I'd like to make a case for legal paternal surrender across the board, not just in cases of rape, much like how I think that abortion should be legal across the board, not just in cases of rape. To do this, I'm going to answer four main objections to legal paternal surrender as I've explained it. Objection number one. Legal paternal surrender would let men have all the sex they want with no consequences, leaving pregnant women in their wake. How is that fair? This is actually a very reasonable concern, and I think it is a good objection to legal paternal surrender as I presented it. I do agree that this needs to be addressed before legal paternal surrender can become the law. Otherwise, women would have to do all the work involved in getting an abortion, while men would simply have to mail in a form and be done with it, which would be completely unfair to women, and it would actually, I think, incentivize men to not use contraception. Why would they when you could just mail in a form? So, in order to make legal paternal surrender as fair as possible for men and women, I would like to propose some caveats to the process that men would have to go through with the goal of mirroring the difficulties that women would have to go through for an abortion. And of course, this would depend on what state you live in and that kind of stuff. So the caveats I propose are as follows. The father could only sign the paperwork at an abortion clinic, if one even exists near him, which is an increasingly concerning problem. The father would have to jump through the same hoops as the mother would have to jump through. So waiting periods, multiple visits, maybe some sort of unnecessary probe, the father would also have to pay a fee equal to the theoretical cost of an abortion at that stage of pregnancy, just as the mother would have to. And finally, the father would have to complete this process in the same time frame as the mother would have to complete the abortion process, which is to say up to about 24 weeks. And this time frame would start when the father learned about the pregnancy, or if the mother kept her pregnancy secret, when he learned about the child. And these are some heavy caveats. But I think that these caveats make each parent's rights and responsibilities about as balanced as we could get them. Furthermore, I'm confident that most men would accept these caveats if it afforded them the right to refuse parenthood. I mean, heck, I personally would even agree to a few good kicks in the balls in order to balance out whatever physical procedure a woman would have to endure, again, if it allowed me to refuse parenthood if I so desired. I think this would be a more equal situation than our current laws, or at least as equal as we can get it within the limits of biology. And I wonder if feminists might even support this, because it gives men a horse in the race, so to speak, regarding abortion laws and restrictions. It forces men to jump through the same hoops as women. So maybe, just maybe, they'd be a little more motivated to remove those hoops, rather than consigning themselves to the whims of the mother, who often, 60% of cases, unintended pregnancies, decides to keep the baby anyway, so in our current system, there's not much incentive for men to fight against these abortion barriers when chances are the mother won't actually choose that path. Objection number two. The child has the right to the financial resources it needs. The child's right to basic necessities outweighs the father's right to his money. Response number 2a. This assumes that all single mothers are struggling and that they need help in order to provide their children with basic necessities, which is simply not true. Mothers who don't need child support still receive it from fathers. So in these situations, there is no conflict between the child's rights and the father's rights. The father's money is being taken merely for the comfort and the convenience of the child and the mother. Besides, if financial support from a second party was always required in cases of single parenthood, then it would be mandatory for each single parent household to receive money from others to help with their child, which is simply not the case. Response number 2b. In cases where a single mother is struggling to provide basic necessities for her child, I think the state should assist her as a form of welfare. I don't know, maybe food stamps or any of the other provisions that already exist. Or, if conditions are really bad, that's what child protective services are for. The bottom line is, we already have provisions in place for struggling single parents. So how can it be argued that the child needs the father's money? It's not going to end up in the street without it. Response number 2C. This argument has also been phrased in a broader way, which says, having the support of both parents is in the child's best interest. 
Now, the YouTuber Girl Writes What, or Karen Strawn, does a very good job of addressing this argument in her video LPS Part 2, The Rights of the Child, link in the description. But suffice it to say that there are many things which are in the child's best interest, which parents are not required to do. And there are many things that can make a child's situation worse, which parents are not barred from doing. A parent may turn down a big promotion because they like their current job, you know, keeping their current salary. A parent may join the military and be gone for a long time, or, you know, forever. A parent may even take up smoking, but the government does not get to control these decisions for the child's best interest. Unless, of course, conditions get really bad, in which case that's what child protective services are for, as I mentioned. So the argument that fathers should be legally required to pay child support for their child's best interest has no precedent, and in fact has many counterexamples. And you know, as long as we're taking men's money for the child's best interest, why don't we just take some of Bill Gates' money? I mean, that's a lot more practical, both for the man involved and for the child, and Bill Gates is just as responsible for the mother's decision to keep the child as the father's were, so why not take some of Bill Gates' money? Just a thought. Response 2D. Yet another similar argument is made which says, you can't just abandon your child once it's born. And of course, the motivation behind this argument is to argue that abortion is not morally equivalent to legal paternal surrender. Abortion is severing your ties to an unborn, unfeeling fetus, whereas legal paternal surrender is severing your ties to a living, breathing, feeling child. So, of course, they say, well, you can't just abandon your child once it's born. Except you can, legally. Mothers do it all the time through what are called safe haven laws, but men don't get to do that. Men cannot choose to abandon their born children, but women can. I should take a moment to explain what safe haven laws are. In the United States, all 50 states have some form of safe haven law, and these laws basically say that you're allowed to drop off a healthy baby at a police station, hospital, or fire station within a certain time frame after its birth, no questions asked. Usually the time frame is less than 72 hours, but sometimes it can be up to a month. And again, you're allowed to legally just drop off your baby, no questions asked, just because you don't want it. And actually, safe haven laws in the United States have a rather interesting and fairly disturbing origin. It used to be the case, and to some extent it still is the case, that new mothers who simply didn't want their babies would sometimes choose to throw their unwanted babies into dumpsters and leave them there to die. By 1999, lawmakers began creating safe havens in order to prevent the deaths of these babies, and these laws have been fairly successful. But it kind of leads me to wonder, maybe the best way for fathers to secure the right to legal paternal surrender is if they made a concerted group effort to kill their children. I mean, that seems to be how this works. However, of course, if this happened, I doubt they'd be given the same accommodating treatment that mothers were given. Objection number three. Her body, her choice. Abortion rights do not derive from the right to opt out of parenthood, but from the right to sovereignty over one's body. Response number 3a. Here's a thought experiment. Suppose I invented an artificial uterus that could carry a fetus to term. If you became pregnant but did not want to undergo pregnancy, you could instantly and painlessly transplant the fetus into the artificial uterus. Essentially, I'm asking you to imagine a world in which the mother's body was no longer a necessary factor in human reproduction. In other words, imagine a world where the only prenatal role was that of a father. Now, if this technology existed, would you really be okay with a complete ban on abortions because it's no longer her body, so it's no longer her choice? Would you agree that women should become financially responsible for a child for 18 or more years just because a condom broke? I doubt it. That being said, why don't fathers deserve the same right? Furthermore, this objection to LPS also implies that the only valid reason to get an abortion is because you don't want to undergo pregnancy and giving birth. However, most of the common reasons why women get abortions have nothing to do with their bodies. Usually, women get abortions because they don't want to be responsible for the child that results. They say things like, I can't afford a baby, or I need to finish my education. Men can cite nearly all of the same reasons that women do for not wanting to be parents, and if these reasons are valid for women who don't want to be parents, why aren't they valid for men? 
I've included two links in the description which are surveys of why women choose to get abortions. Response number 3b. Yes, it is her body, and by that token, it is her choice. But it's also his future, her choice. If a woman decides to keep the baby, that's her choice, and I think it should be her responsibility, not his. But I think that the reverse should also be true, that is, reversing the genders. I think that if a mother gives birth and chooses to give the baby away for adoption or drop it off at a safe haven, but the father chooses to keep it, then that's his choice and his responsibility, and the mother should have no further obligation to the child or the father. In our current system, it can happen where the mother chooses to give away the baby, only to have the father take it, at which point she can become liable for child support, not because of her choices, but because of the father's choice, and I don't think that's fair either. Let people take responsibility for their own choices, not for their partners. As you can see, my argument for legal paternal surrender is also an argument against legally required child support in situations where there was no prior agreement to raise the child in question. I'm not arguing against child support in its entirety, just in situations where the mother or father never agreed to become a parent. This stands in stark contrast with situations where parents have already committed to raising a child, for example, in cases of divorces with children. Basically, you can't change your mind once you've already had a child established in your care. You've signed the social contract, and you have to see it through. But, if you never made that commitment in the first place, then you shouldn't be held to it, whether you are a woman or a man. Objection number four. Actions have consequences, and you need to accept the responsibility for your actions. This is, of course, referring to the action of choosing to have sex with or without protection, and the consequence of risking pregnancy. Here is the same objection in a different context. You tell me if you still think it's a reasonable argument. In the United States in 1960, black people could choose to risk jail time for using white-only facilities. Well, what's the problem? Just don't drink from the nice whites-only water fountain. You need to understand that actions have risks and consequences. To which someone would reasonably say, but the law that dictates those consequences is unfair. White people don't have to take those kinds of risks. Well, that's too bad. Either deal with reality or don't. In fact, this same argument could have been made, and probably was made, toward women before Roe v. Wade legalized abortion here in the United States. Well, what's the problem? Just don't have sex or use protection or get sterilized, but you have to understand that actions have consequences. Why do you need the right to an abortion? That just makes no sense. And here's the takeaway point. Just because you can mitigate your risks within the current laws, that doesn't mean that the laws themselves are fair. In our current system of laws about parenthood, and in our old laws about whites-only facilities, the consequences are more severe and less avoidable for one specific group of people, in this case men, for no other reason than the lack of a simple legal provision, which in this case is legal paternal surrender, and in our 1960s black people analogy, is Brown v. Board of Education and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I've heard it argued many times and in many places that men do have reproductive rights. They have the right to wear a condom. Yeah, and black people have the right to drink at the colored water fountains. Well, it works. Is it that hard to avoid the unwanted consequences? Actions have consequences, yes. But in our current legal system, when it comes to the right to choose parenthood, Women can escape those consequences much more easily and much more assuredly than men can, not because of biology, but because the law simply does not allow it. That is unfair, and that is why I think legal paternal surrender, as I've outlined it, is a good idea. With legal paternal surrender, sex would still have consequences, but those consequences would be more equal for men and women. To a large extent, the argument in favor of legal paternal surrender boils down to this. If a man has unprotected sex and isn't ready to be a father, he's a selfish deadbeat who has no sense of responsibility. But if a woman has unprotected sex and isn't ready to be a mother, she's just pro-choice. This is a clear case of a legal double standard that can and should be corrected, and the solution is very simple and unambiguous. Men need the right to legally renounce their fatherhood. Men need legal paternal surrender.